It is now time for a question period. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. <clears throat> My question this morning, uh, Speaker, is for the Premier. Premier, this morning, uh, the Ontario Power Authority's CEO, Colin Anderson, brought a spreadsheet to the Justice Committee that showed the cost of the Oakville cancellation to be $1.1 billion less, less any savings. I'm sorry he had to disclose that on you. Order. Thank you. 1.1 billion less any savings for a net cost potentially 310 million. Clark. The member from Willowdale will come to order, and I'll start identifying individuals. That includes members on all sides. That includes members on all sides. I'm trying to get control. And I'm uh, the member from uh, Renfrew has just got himself uh, a little deeper than I think he wants to. I'm seeking uh, your cooperation. I will identify individuals from here on in. Please finish your question. Thank you. Uh, I asked him if the government knew it was more than $40 million, and he said yes. Shame and when I asked him Shame who in the government knew, Speaker, his answer was one word everybody. Oh. Premier, will you now apologize to Ontarians for not telling them what you've known all along about this Minister gas plant scandal? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, all parties, first of all, opposed the Oakville facility. The government honoured its commitment to the people of Oakville and renegotiated Stop the clock. As I've tried to indicate to you, it does go both ways, and it is starting to happen that way. So the member from Renfrew for the second time, would you please come to order? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the government honoured its commitment to the people of Oakville and renegotiated the Oakville facility. Member from Leeds Mr. Grenville Speaker, will come to order. In September 2012, the Ontario Power Authority posted on its website the Memorandum of Understanding and a 216-page contract. Mr. Speaker, that contract identified sunk costs. It also contemplated a wide range of other costs. That was there for the whole world to see in September 2012. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General in his Mississauga report it was very, very clear from that that these are very complex negotiate, very complex Thank calculations. Thank you. Mr. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Premier, given what we've heard this morning, I hope you're not going to follow the path of the other Liberal witnesses who've appeared before the Justice Committee when you testify today. They've either all developed sudden-onset selective amnesia, or they just plain didn't tell the whole truth to the Committee. One admitted to destroying documents illegally, while another ordered the OPA to withhold documents. We heard that this morning from Colin Anderson again. Ontarians are fed up with this obstructive nature and are fed up with the Liberals taking care of their political whims with hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer and ratepayer money. Premier, how can you expect Question. to maintain confidence of this House and Ontarians when you knew all along your numbers were false? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I'll continue uh, the uh, the answer that I was uh, in the middle of before. Uh, what's clear from today, as well as the previous auditor's report, that the calculations are very, very difficult. So complex, Mr. Speaker, that this morning at committee, the OPA. Uh, acknowledged an estimate that it made about four weeks ago with a particular cost. It had a different cost today. Mr. Speaker, uh, the consultant that was, uh, that was referred to in the particular report also had a different cost figure. The opposition has a different cost figure. Mr. Speaker, that's why the Premier asked the Auditor General to come and do her report, because we need an independent, reliable figure that yes, we sir. can count on moving forward, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, I asked Colin Anderson who in the government knew the cost of cancelling Oakville would be more than $40 million, and his answer was everybody. Shame on you all. 
Premier, there's nowhere for you to go now except to come this afternoon and tell the truth. You've known about the costs for months and yet have stood in this legislature, you and your ministers, and told us something different. Behaviour like that is why you do not have the confidence of Ontarians, and nor should you. Premier, what are you going to tell us this afternoon that you couldn't have told us a year ago? Mr. Speaker, September 2012, the whole world knew there were extra costs. It was on the OPA website. 216-page contract identified sunk costs. They identified that there will be more calculations and more costs to come. Mr. Speaker, the, the critic. Well, that's about it. So I will come to this side and say the same. I'll start uh, identifying you individually. And my ear is pretty good. I don't even have to see you sometimes. Mr. Speaker, we agree with them. The whole world knew that there were additional costs. It was on the website. The critic stands up and he misrepresents. He speaks. Well, let me do my job, please. Member will withdraw. Thank you. Then withdraw. <coughs> Mr. Speaker. What I will say is that he uses selective facts and selective quotes without completing the sentence, without stating, without stating Answer. Mr. Speaker, that the whole world knew there were additional costs, there was a 216-page contract, and if he didn't read it in Thank September you. 2012, that's his problem. Do your job Thank right. You. No question. Uh, member from Chatham will come to order. No question, the member from Simcoe Gray. Uh, Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Premier Colin Anderson from the Ontario Power Authority said that your gas plant uh, Oakville decision is at least $310 million. That's eight times the amount you stood and told this House. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians are disgusted. And what's even more disgusting is the Premier's arrogance by saying this week that this House only gets one confidence vote, and that will be the budget. That's her decision. Forget the parliamentary rights of the rest of you. Well, Mr. Speaker, the budget to be tabled will be overseen by a Premier who's been rather liberal with the truth, and it will be tabled by a— Stop the clock, please. You can't say indirectly what you can't say indirectly, so I'm asking the member to withdraw. Draw, Mr. Speaker. And it would be tabled by a Minister of Finance whose seat was bought by one of the gas plant decisions. So I asked the Premier, do you honestly believe that this House has confidence in your government? If so, Question. then why don't you call the non-confidence motion right now and test your theory? Thank you. The Minister of Energy, uh, come to order, please. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I've I've been very clear on the uh, the issue of confidence. I believe that the the budget is a is a uh, an imminent and an important opportunity for the legislature to express confidence or non-confidence in the government, Mr. Speaker. I really hope that the members opposite will read the budget and then they will make their decision, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just want to I just want to say this, Mr. Speaker. I will appear before the I'll appear before General. the committee this afternoon, but. Whether I'm in this house, whether I'm in the hall speaking to media, whether I'm at an event in, uh, in some part of the province, I always tell the truth, Mr. Speaker, the truth that I know. Absolutely. I do. Opposite. Uh, the members opposite are in a position, Mr. Speaker, today that they uh, they want Remember to here, they want to undermine that Thank statement. You. But the reality is that is the truth, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Thank you. Supplementary. 
Well, Premier, you chaired the meeting where the Oakville cancellation was approved. You signed off on the Cabinet Minute approving the cancellation of the Oakville plant. You stood in this House and you told us a dollar number that you knew was not the whole truth. Colin Anderson said just a few minutes ago, downstairs in committee, that everyone knew, that everyone knew the true cost and that it was much higher than what the Liberal Party and what you yourself have admitted. So, so Mr. Speaker, I ask the Premier, who's telling the truth? Your Minister of Social Services, come to that order. Up as an expert and said that we should respect a longtime civil servant, Colin Anderson, or are you the Premier? Are you telling the truth when you didn't know the true cost, or is Colin Anderson telling the truth, which he just said under oath? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, the I didn't. Thank you. Premier. I believe that Colin Anderson was telling the truth, absolutely. We called the OPA to, OPA to committee, Mr. Speaker, to answer questions about the Oakville cost. This morning, this morning, as I understand it, the OPA provided two different cost estimates, Mr. Speaker. Both estimates differ from what the OPA previously advised the government, Mr. Speaker. That makes the case, Mr. Speaker, that it's extremely important that we have the Auditor General look at the books and determine the cost, Mr. Speaker. That is why I called and asked the Auditor General to look at the Oakville situation. That's why I asked the Auditor General to look at it, Mr. Speaker, because of the complexity that the Minister of Energy was talking about, because of the complexity that the Colin Anderson Halton, spoke about. The member from Halton, come to order. The member from Every Prince Edward Hastings, come to order. Every time I have spoken on this issue, Mr. Speaker, I have actually. told the truth as I have understood it. I will continue to do that today and at committee, Mr. Speaker. Do you see it, please? Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to be clear. The Premier stood in this House on September 24, 2012, and said directly that the costs of Oakville were $40 million. The Liberals screamed and howled every time we, the Tories, said that wasn't true. Now, we can understand the Liberals wanting to buy off the NDP in an attempt to cling to power during the budget discussions. But what we can understand on this side of the House is why it's in the best interest of taxpayers or the half a million people on the in this province to keep this government going to anyway prop up this government. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have been caught red-handed and red-faced. Won't you get up now and apologize to the people of Ontario for not telling them the whole truth? You have an opportunity to do that. You have an opportunity to save what little reputation you have. Apologize and call the non-confidence vote. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think that the complexity that Colin Anderson from the OPA talked about this morning makes it very clear that waiting for the Auditor General's report is extremely important in this case. What, what, I want, what I want to say to the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, is that I regret that this situation has come to this. I regret that we are in this situation, we collectively, Mr. Speaker, because every party in this House said that they wanted to make sure that these cancellations happen, Mr. Speaker. The complexity was not going to go away if it had been the PCs who had been implementing the decision or if it had been the NDP who were implementing the decision. The complexity around the costs of these cancellations was going to be in place no matter who implemented the decision. We implemented it, Mr. Speaker. At every juncture, we were given information. That's the information that I relayed whenever I spoke on the issue, Mr. Speaker. And I, when I came into this office, I said, we've got to get, we've got to get these questions answered. That's why we opened up the process. That's why the committee has had the opportunity to ask these questions. Third, the, member, the leader of the third party, new question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. The Premier likes to describe her government as new. People want change from the same old politics that have left them cynical about the work that we do here. Does the Premier agree that it's time for that kind of change? Premier. Well, I'm not sure exactly where the, uh, the leader of the third party is going with this, Mr. Speaker, but 
uh, you know, from my perspective, what's very important is that I follow through on what I said I was going to do. I said that we needed to open up the process around the, uh, the gas plant discussion, that we needed to make sure that all documents were available, that we needed to broaden the mandate of the committee and make sure that all questions could be asked about every aspect of the decision, Mr. Speaker. That's what I've done. At different junctures, the opposition, uh, both opposition parties didn't want us to open up the process as much as we wanted it open. We've managed to get it open so that the committee can ask its range of questions. I think that's what I said I was going to do. I followed through, Mr. Speaker. So, from my perspective, that's Answer. what the people of Ontario should be able to expect. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier keeps insisting that things have changed, but anyone watching committee this morning, the committee that was charged with looking into the cancelled gas plants, can see that it's politics as usual here at Queen's Park. This morning, the head of the OPA confirmed that this, the cost of scrapping the private power deal in Oakville was eight times more, eight times higher than the government claimed. Does the Premier think this will make people more cynical or less cynical about politics in Ontario? Premier. Well, you know, I hope that what comes out of this is a better process, Mr. Speaker, that we can make sure that this doesn't happen again, because the reality is the that member from Bruce the, Gray won't sound come to the order. fact that the OPA has had different numbers to report at different points, Mr. Speaker, is a real problem. It creates frustration. It, cr it creates uh, a sense of insecurity in terms of, well, what are the experts actually looking at and how do we calculate these numbers? So how do we make sure that in the future we have a better upfront process, we make a good decision about citing this kind of infrastructure? But, Mr. Speaker, if there has to be a cancellation, I think we all need to ask, Answer. how do we better predict what the costs are going to be? Be, and how do we avoid a situation where the people who are the experts, and they are the experts, on whom we are relying, are able to give us better estimates? Before we go to the supplementary, I'd ask the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek to come to order, please. Supplementary, final supplement. Speaker, the Premier said she'd offer change, but instead of real answers and explanations, Liberals are busy trying to call fail Tory candidates to testify at committee in a desperate attempt to score some political Order. points, and Tories table motions that will never be called for debate in this House. Does the Premier think this is the sort of change the people of this province want? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, we also called the OPA to come and to uh, deliver their, uh, their information, Mr. Speaker. We're trying to get, and I know the OPA came as an NDP witness, but we had asked that they, came, that they come earlier. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that we are working with the committee process. We are trying to get the information out. We're trying to make sure that all the documents that both the NDP and the Conservatives have asked for are available and that everyone who they've asked to come forward is coming, are coming forward. I'm going to be there this afternoon. Afternoon, Mr. That, Speaker. This is not a political game. From my perspective, this is about making sure that people have the information that they need, and it's about making sure that we find a way to work together and ensure that the Answer. next time around we have better information, we have a better upfront process, and the community is involved earlier on so that we don't get into a situation like this again. New question? Speaker, in tough times, people are looking for some uh, real sense that their government will put the challenges facing people at the top of the agenda and not the challenges facing the Liberal Party and their well-connected insiders. The Premier's made it clear what her priority is when it comes to facing the facts on the cancelled gas plants. Is she ready to admit that this just isn't good enough for families who expect more and better from their government? Speaker, I, you know, I have said that I regret that this situation ha evolved the way it did, that we did not collectively have a better process in place so that the decision could have been made up front. I, I agree with the, the leader of the third party Second that this should not have happened the way it happened, Mr. Speaker. I agree that we should have had better information and that we should have been able to pin, ta pin down what the costs were going to be in the first place. But, Mr. Speaker, the reality is this is 
where we are. A decision was made that was agreed to by all of the parties in the Legislature, Mr. Speaker, and we are having to deal with the fallout from that. And I am not happy with that. I'm not happy with that at all, Mr. Speaker, and I don't, I don't think the people of Ontario should be happy about it either. But what they should expect is that we get all the information, Answer. we learn from the situation, and we put a better process in place next time around, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Speaker, people feel like they're falling behind, and they'd like some sense that the government understands their challenges and will put their needs first. That's not what they've been seeing here in Ontario, Speaker. The millions of dollars handed to the hedge funds so the government could scrap gas plants and hold on to political power is just one example. But when people see that money can be found for corporate tax loopholes and CEO salary hikes in hospitals, while well, they're being told to pay more and expect less, they know Know that it's time for a change. Is the Premier ready to put people first in this province? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that is exactly what our throne speech and what our budget is going to be about, Mr. Speaker. We are, we are committed to a fairer society, and I think that the leader of the third party understands that what that means. That means focus, focusing on the education, on the health care that our citizens in this province need, Mr. Speaker, that every resident of Ontario, every child in the province, every senior who needs service, every child who needs an education, Mr. Speaker, has access to that excellent uh, institution that we, that we are so proud of in, in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That's what the budget will be about. The budget will also be about making sure that we have the conditions for economic growth, making sure that we are fiscally responsible so that we can deliver those services that the people in Ontario need, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, for people struggling with tough times, this isn't a game. It's millions and millions of dollars that could have been invested in hiring nurses, that could have been invested in creating more home care, or it could have been invested in helping young people to find the job that they need. And when they open the papers today, they see a lot more of the same. Top executives at Ontario's Lottery Corporation getting fat raises, while people receiving chemotherapy treatment learned that their government refused to regulate the company that was mixing their drugs. Is the Premier ready to get her priorities in check and not just talk about it? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the leader of the third party, I think, knows that it's extremely important that we absolutely put people at the center, put the people of Ontario at the center of all of the decisions that we make, and to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that as we bring our budget forward, that we recognize that making people's lives better, making sure that young people have access to employment, Mr. Speaker, making sure that people who need care in their homes get that home care, Mr. Speaker, making sure that people in our northern and rural communities and the children who are uh, the Aboriginal children who are not succeeding at school get the support that they need, Mr. Speaker. Those are the priorities that we need to focus on in terms of, of making this province a fairer society, Mr. Speaker. In That's order right. to do that, we need to stay on track in terms of our fiscal plan, and we're going to do that, and we'll be bringing that budget to this House on Thursday, Mr. Speaker. Good question. A member from the Carleton. Thank you so very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier of Ontario. Um, it's dealing with a very serious matter, Speaker. It Order. deals not only with her eroding credibility, but also with the confidence the people of this province have in her government. Uh, I was at the Justice Committee earlier today when Colin Anderson made it very clear that everybody, everybody. knew that those costs were much higher than 40 per cent. I assume, as do all of my colleagues, that everybody includes you. Uh, you've known all along that the costs of this politically motivated Minister, decision the environment were huge, will come to order. but you misrepresented those numbers members in this house several times. The member knows uh, that it's not allowable. Withdraw, please. Speaker, uh, the, the, the Premier knew, as a minister and now as Premier, that those $40 million figures she had been suggesting weren't true. So we have a serious question for you. When were you first briefed that this $40 million figure was inaccurate? And can you tell this House why you deserve to have the confidence of the people of Ontario, given what you have done? Question. That's a good question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, know that the, uh, I know that the government House leader will want to comment on the supplementary because I know he's been following the issue very closely, Mr. Speaker. But I just, I just want to know, I just want the member opposite to know that 
no matter her accusations, no matter the tone with which she. Well, somebody's making it too loud. Thank you, Premier. No matter the tone in which she delivers the uh, the accusation, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that I have. I have said I will appear at the committee. I will tell the committee exactly what I, what I know and my experience of this situation. I will answer all the questions, and I will continue to do what I have done all along, which is tell the truth at every juncture. I will tell the truth as I understand it at every juncture, whether I'm here in this House or whether I'm at committee or whether I'm out in the halls. Thank you. The member from Lanark will come to order, please. Supplementary. Much, Mr. Speaker. She can run and she can hide, but the people of Ontario have seen what this government has done. Don't take my word for it. Colin Anderson said it right in front of me in Justice Committee that the $40 million figure was 775 times higher and that Order. everybody knew. His words, Speaker, they weren't mine. They weren't the member from Nipissing's. They were her own hand picked OPA chair. We know that Premier Wynne chaired the cabinet committee that signed off on the documents. We know that she was the campaign chair for the Liberals in the last election. We know she sat around the table when, when Colin Anderson said everybody knew the costs were much higher than $40 million. And then she stands in this House on September 25th and continues to cite that erroneous figure. Mr. Speaker, the people of this province have lost confidence. They want to know, will she put our want of confidence motion on the floor to be debated and to Thank you. Premier. Hmm? John. Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Speaker. Let's start. Order, please. Order, please. Mr. Speaker, let's let's start dealing in facts. This is what Mr. Anderson, what Mr. Anderson had to say in front of the committee this morning. And I quote: "Member from Halton will come to order, and I believe that's the second time I've." His writing's name. Government House Leader. Let's quote uh, from Mr. Anderson in front of the committee this morning. The $40 million number was the one that was used at the time of the announcement because it was the one that was very crystallized, if you will, at that point of time. But what was key in the sense that you just used $40 million in sunk costs because that's exactly what it describes. It's the sunk cost which was acknowledged all along as only being a portion of the cost. There were other elements that were noted. But you know what else, Mr. Speaker, Colin Anderson had to say? He said, and I quote, Mr. Speaker, we have a board and we talked about the fact that there was a very strong commitment on the part of the government and all three parties and the citizens in the area. The member from Holden will uh, desist, please. You have a 10 Speaker, second wrap up. Mr. Anderson acknowledged. The very simple fact that the Progressive Conservative Party was out there on the campaign trail supporting the relocation of both those plans. Thank you. New question. The member from, member from Nickelville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term long -term Care. The committee heard from Marchese, the company that supplied the diluted chemo drugs to the hospital. Marchese has always known that they were unregulated. Marchese actually told us that they had directly asked both federal and provincial officials to oversee their operation, but they were refused. Why did the province refuse to regulate Marchese even after they were asked? Thank you, well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for this question. I think it's uh, very important to note that, the, that Marchese 
did approach the College of Pharmacists. The College of Pharmacists reported back to Marchese that because, because this was not, uh, these were not drugs that were being uh, uh, mixed for individual patients, it did not fall under the definition of a pharmacy. Therefore, it did not fall under the jurisdiction of the College of Pharmacists. The College of Pharmacists referred Marchese to Health Canada. Health Canada is responsible for the manufacturing of drugs. Indeed, it has a policy on its books that if a pharmacy does not fit under the definition of the pharmacy, then it likely is a manufacturing and falls under the jurisdiction of Health Canada. Thank you. Supplementary. It is still it is still rather disappointing to hear the answer from the Minister of Health. It's as if the College of Pharmacists exists out there without the oversight of her ministry. And it's as if the gray area is still news to her ministry. But these were facts that were known long ago. The reality is that the government chose to do nothing. To make matters worse, the government now seems to be putting the responsibility of oversight on the backs of our hospital. So my question is rather simple. Does the minister understand that it is her job to provide oversight to our health care system? Minister. Speaker, I uh, take my responsibility extremely seriously. I do think it's important that the member opposite understands that Health Canada is responsible for the safety yeah. of drugs. Yeah. And I was very, very pleased that Health Canada has clarified the position and that we have introduced regulations, that the College of Pharmacists is posting regulations that will fix this problem, Speaker, that will go a long way to, to, uh, to fixing this gray area. Speaker, I am as uh, concerned about this situation as anyone Member from and that is why we are order. taking strong steps to fix the problem. Yeah. Thank you. New question. The member from Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment. Speaker, last week the Minister released a 2011 Air Quality in Ontario report, which marked the 41st year of long term reporting on air quality in Ontario. Research has shown that air pollution has negative health effects, increased health care costs, and caused premature deaths. The 2011 Air Quality report concluded that there was decrease in the levels of air pollutants and the air quality improvement in Ontario. This is great news, especially in the health of the youngest residents in my riding of Scarborough Agent Court. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can he tell the House the improvements have been made since the last air quality report? Thank you, Mr. The yes. yes, Mr. Speaker, Ontario's air quality is continuing to improve. Here, here. Emissions That's of harmful air pollutants continue to decrease. Air quality has improved significantly over the last 10 years, especially nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, and sulfur dioxide, three major smog-causing pollutants. We also measure levels of fine particulate matter, tiny particles in the air that can come from a variety of sources like aerosols, smoke, fumes, dust, fly ash, and pollen. Yearly averages have decreased okay. approximately 30 per cent since 2003. Fine particulate emissions from industrial processes have decreased by more than 57 per cent great over the 10-year period from 2001 to 2010, and the transportation sector shows a gradual decrease of 23 per cent over the same period. The report confirms the actions we have taken, specifically the phase-out of coal, emission trading regulations, exactly. emission controls Thank on you. Ontario spelters, and drive-clean emissions. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to thank the Minister for his leadership and sharing with the House the positive news. Incredible the air quality leadership. in Ontario has improved significantly over the past several years. In the Minister's answer, he identified some of the progressive initiatives that our government has undertaken, which improved Ontario's health and taken our commitment to the environment seriously. Since 2003, our government recognized that the health of our Ontario community, like my riding of Scarborough Aging Court, and the environment is a high priority, and we have taken many steps to improve the air quality in Ontario. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he explain what our government is, go is doing to do to improve the air quality in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Well, Ontario's air standards, as you would know, are among the toughest in North America. Absolutely. We're still looking at new ways to improve our air quality. We don't intend to give back the gains we've made 
and there's still more to be done. Exactly. Eliminating dirty coal-fired electri electricity generating units is the largest initiative of its kind in all of North America. Since 2003, our government has cut coal use in Ontario by nearly 90 per cent. By the end of this year, we will only have two coal plants operating, and by the end of 2014, Ontario will be one of the first places in the world to eliminate coal as a source of electricity production. Our emissions trading regulations for nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide have helped to reduce air pollutants, and the drive clean emissions testing has successfully reduced emissions in our transportation sector, an area where reductions are needed and difficult uh, to achieve. Ontario's long-term energy plan is helping to improve our air quality by increasing the use of emission-free electricity, Thank such you. as wind, solar, and other forms yeah, of clean control. energy. Thank you. New question, the member from Wellington, Holland Hills. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. My question is for the Premier. In light of the emerging gas plant scandal, where the government schemed to understate the true cost of cancelling the Oakville and Mississauga gas plants, and then took deliberate steps to hide who was responsible for deciding to cancel the gas plants. How can the Premier continue to maintain the pretense that her government has the confidence of this House? Mr. Speaker, there, there's been a lot of talk this morning about transparency. This afternoon, the Premier of this province will be appearing before the it's committee a as suggested. Here. After the arrogance, Mr. Speaker, of what went on across the way, and I hope, Mr. Speaker, that there will be an apology to the Premier for the member from Prince Edward Hastings who stood in this House and said, shouldn't we have to haul you before the committee like some Quebec construction industry snitch? The member, the member from, from Leeds Grenville who talked about playing calendar and playing games, and yet, Mr. Speaker, when we asked the Leader of the Opposition to be for to be before oh, the committee today he was it? suddenly too busy mr speaker he may appear on the 7th or the 14th who knows when we asked jeff yanisik the candidate in mississauga south to come before the committee he has refused and mr speaker i will go on in my supplementary um, there are there's a moment there's a moment in which it's difficult to find whether or not I can land somewhere because everyone's heckling, even when the answer is being given from the members of that side and when the question is being put on that side. It would help everybody if, it, if, if we all agreed just to stop heckling and let the question be put and the answer be put. Supplementary, please. Well, Mr. Speaker, the free motion is a confidence motion, but taken literally, it only pertains to the budgetary policy of the government, not confidence in an overall sense. In contrast, our confidence motion allows for a more comprehensive test of the confidence that the House has in the government, setting aside the political auction sales that the last two budgets have become in this minority parliament. Hundreds of years of parliamentary tradition dictate that any vote can be designated as confidence by the government, and any government that can't command the confidence of the House should resign. By refusing to call the confidence motion for debate and a vote in this House, the de government demonstrates that it believes it might be defeated if a vote were held. If they themselves don't believe that they can command the confidence of the House, what gives them the right to table a budget this really? Thursday afternoon? Thank you. Thank you. Answer. You know, Mr. Speaker, I keep, political game. I keep hearing heckles across the way that this is a serious business, and it is a serious business. The member from Central Grey come to order. The member from Leeds Grenville come to order. Thank you. Now you got it. Mr. Speaker, this is this isn't political games that we're asking these people to come before committee. Jeff Yanisik put out a press release saying, unlike the Dalton McGuinty Liberals, candidate. the only way to guarantee this power plant does not get, does not get built is to elect a Tim Hudak, Ontario PC is. government. We asked him to come before the committee no. to talk about the PC's position He's on the cancellation. He has refused. We asked, Ms. We asked Mary Ann DeMont Whalen to come before the committee. She put out a, a 
pamphlet to thousands of houses saying the only party that will stop the Sherway power plant is the Ontario I PC the party, and this right morning here. at the last minute, Mr. Speaker, she cancelled. Will they work Thank with you. their colleagues to make sure that these witnesses come before the committee? No question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Emails from Chris Morley, former Chief of Staff to Dalton McGuinty, show the Premier was briefed personally about cancelling the Oakville gas plant. Presumably, there was a discussion of costs. Does the Premier agree that it costs a lot more than $40 million to relocate the Oakville gas plant? And when did she know that these costs were much higher than her government was claiming? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the member opposite knows that I am going to be at committee this afternoon. I am going to be speaking to whatever questions uh, are put before me, Mr. Speaker. And I will just say again that at every juncture, when information was given to me, that was the information that uh, that I related, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I talked about the uh, the information as I understood it. But the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that this morning the OPA provided two different cost estimates. Both estimates differ from what the OPA previously advised the government, Mr. Speaker. The estimates have changed over time, Mr. Speaker. That is what the OPA said this morning, Mr. Speaker, and I will be at committee this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Speaker, for months the government has claimed it cost $40 million to cancel the Oakville gas plant. The Minister of Energy said on October 3, 2012, quote, let's be very clear, the memorandum of agreement speaks to the cost and we know that the cost is $40 million. And since the Premier was sworn in, she hasn't corrected that number. We know the Premier was briefed by Chris Morley before she signed her name to the government policy to go into arbitration on Oakville. Why did it take months of public pressure and committee hearings to get the Premier to agree that the cost was a lot more than $40 million? Mr. Speaker, it was this Premier who has asked the Auditor General and officer right, of the Legislature to look into it. But, Mr. Speaker, there was a bit of noise before, a little bit of enthusiasm. Let me share Colin Anderson's quote from this morning. The $40 million number was the one that was used at the time of the announcement because exactly. it was the one that was very crystallized, if you will, at that there point in time. What was key in the sentence that you just used $40 million in sunk costs because that's exactly what it describes. It's a there sunk it cost, which was acknowledged all along as only being a portion of the cost. There, there were other elements that were noted. Mr. Speaker, we have asked the Auditor General to look into it, as has been pointed out. A number number of figures were provided by the OPA. Let's allow the Auditor Answer. General to do his work, and let's have the committee start to do some productive work to make sure yeah. a situation like this doesn't arise in the future. Question. The member from Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, Thunder Bay and the surrounding area uh, municipalities of Oliver, Papoon and Conmy experienced significant flood damage in May 2012. This flooding, which was reported to be as high as six feet in some basements, resulted in damages to 4,400 homes and businesses, affecting countless families. It also resulted in significant damage to municipal infrastructure, washing out roads, bridges, damaging culverts, and causing shoulder erosion and sinkholes. Speaker, could the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing tell this House what the government has done to help the people of Thunder Bay, Oliver Papoonj, and Conmy to help them recover from this flood? Thank you, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank my colleague for the question, and I want to recognize the people and the staff and the first responders of Thunder Bay and Oliver Papoonj and Conmy for their tireless work during and after this disaster to help their community. As the House may know, I was up in Thunder Bay last week and I was able to meet with the Mayor of Thunder Bay, Keith Hobbs, and the Disaster Relief Committee to commend them for their swift action at the time of the flooding and their assistance to residents to recover from the flood. They acted quickly, they repaired basements and removed dangerous mold, and they ensured their residents were uh, in a safe and healthy place to Excellent. live. As a result of the hard work and advocacy by my colleagues from Thunder Bay Atacoke and, and, here, here. and Thunder Bay Superior North, I was happy on Friday to inform the City of Thunder Bay that the province will provide $4 million under the Ontario Disaster Relief Answer. Assistance Program to help the city pay for their response, and we continue to work with them today. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. It's good to hear that we have supported the City of Thunder Bay and municipalities in repairing the damage that was caused by this flood to over 4,400 homes. The Minister mentioned in the original answer that our government Order. committed to providing $4 million to help the City of Thunder Bay pay for these repairs to many of the private residents' basements. Unfortunately, there's been claims in this House that our government has only provided $300,000 to the people of Thunder Bay for this disaster. Speaker, could the minister share with this House if our government has provided additional funds to the people of the city of Thunder Bay and the surrounding areas to repair the damage? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the question. The province remains committed to providing up to $17.2 million to Thunder Bay and area municipalities under the Ontario Disaster Relief Assistance Program. To date, we have already provided $3.5 million to help to reduce the financial burden of Thunder Bay and affected municipalities. These funds will help rebuild and rehabilitate infrastructure such as roads and bridges. It also helps reimburse individuals who have suffered losses from this disaster. We've also provided up to $200,000 to cover the administrative costs of the Disaster Relief Committee who are volunteers who have done important work to help the people affected. While I was in Thunder Bay, I was able to clarify the, the ODRAP rules, and when the staff of Municipal Affairs and Housing looked into the estimates of those claims, we noticed they were on the low side. I'm glad to report that the committee will be re-examining its eligible claims, and I expect there will be an adjustment on those claims. Here, here. Good. Thank you. For your question? The member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Colin Anderson's testimony at Justice Committee this morning was a scathing indictment of your Liberal government scandal. He confirmed that your $40 million figure to cancel Oakville is not even remotely accurate and that the true cost is nearly eight times higher. While we have become accustomed to your numbers not adding up, even your finance minister must feel uncomfortable standing behind the fudge numbers related to these gas plant boondoggles. Our want of confidence motion has been tabled, and refusal to call our motion for debate is an affront to democracy. Premier, Will you stand in your place and commit to calling the confidence motion today? Mr. Speaker, again, uh, Colin Anderson appeared in front of the committee. I've shared some of the quotes, some of the material that he talked about, the original $40 million figure. He also provided the committee with a number of different cost estimates, which I think lends a lot of value to the move by this Premier to ask the Auditor General to look into it. But again, Mr. Speaker, the other thing that Colin Anderson pointed out today was that he was very much aware that all parties of this House supported the cancellation That's of right. the Oakville plant. And as I say, Mr. Speaker, these are not political games. When we ask the Leader of the Opposition to come today, a man a man who's starting a YouTube video, a man whose candidates put out uh, press releases and Twitter feed, all promising this to talk about the work that they did, the policy work and valuations. We've asked Conservative candidates Answer. to come forward, and one surprisingly cancelled first thing this morning while another has refused to go. So perhaps in the uh, supplementary, the honourable member you. can talk Where about his efforts to candidate. get them. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Same old, same old spin. Speaker, my question is back to the Premier again. Premier, when you took the week-long mediation course, you must have learned that there are two sides to each dispute and a means to resolve every dispute. In case your memory fails you, I would like to offer the following reminder. Your Liberal government told the hard-working people of Ontario that the cost of cancelling the Mississauga and Oakville gas plants to save Liberal seats in the last election was approximately $355 million lower than the actual cost. The hard-working people of Ontario are tired of your government wasting taxpayer dollars and scandals Premier, the Ontario PCs have tabled a motion to test whether or not the people of Ontario still have confidence in your government, given the accumulation of the scandals under your watch. Premier, will you stand in your place, show some integrity, and call that confidence motion today? Speaker, I, I, I don't see this as being a uh, spin. The member from Halton answered June 1, 2010. The people of Oakville have told you that they don't want the proposed gas-fired pow power plant, and I agree with them. The member from Halton answered September 14, 2010. Oakville residents have called on you to change the location of the proposed Oakville power plant. I have listened to the people of Oakville, and I agree with them. The member from Halton, press release, September 14, 2010. Minister
Minister, will you move the Oakville Power Plant? I am asking the I Minister agree. to consider moving this plant. The member from Halton answered October 19, 2010. I was pleased when it was cancelled that, Mr. Speaker, I could go on. Dozens and dozens of quotes from the opposition, Mr. Speaker, where they put forward the exact same commitment. It was a promise they made and a promise Thank we you. kept. New question, the member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, yesterday we heard from London Health Sciences Centre, the hospital most affected by the, by the diluted chemotherapy drugs. Hospital officials told us they, were they would never have knowingly used a non-regulated provider, that they trusted the safety of the procurement process. Speaker, there is ample evidence that the ministry has known about this grey area for years. Can the minister explain why her ministry did nothing for so long? Yeah. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Uh, well, Speaker, I, I welcome the question, and uh, and I, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to the people from London Health Science Centre oh, who appeared yesterday, and I think gave very thoughtful, uh, very thorough answers to the questions that were put to them. This has been a difficult time for everyone at London Health Sciences, and I applaud them coming and giving the answers uh, that they did yesterday. Speaker, as I said to the earlier question on this issue, uh, Marchese uh, did approach uh, the Your College family. of Pharmacists. The College of Pharmac Pharmacists informed them that they did not have the authority to regulate that uh, particular activity referred them to Health Canada. Speaker, I think what is very important here is that we are taking the steps necessary in collaboration with Health Canada to ensure that this Answer. does not happen again. Supplementary. Speaker, Ontarians want to know exactly what went wrong and how this could have happened. For the almost 700 patients affected in London, the urgency is even greater. The hospital seemed to do everything in its power to protect its patients, but the ministry failed in its duty of oversight. Will the minister explain why she failed to protect patients in London when they needed the protection the most? Well, Speaker, I, I agree that we— That's the test. The member from Lanark is warned. Carry on. I completely agree that the patients affected and their loved ones deserve answers, and that is why I have appointed Dr. Dr. Jake Thiessen to really do a thorough investigation so we can get Hamilton answers East and we can take close. appropriate steps. We're not waiting, though, Speaker, to take the, uh, uh, steps. The College of Pharmacists and the hospitals are taking appropriate steps now, but we do await the longer, uh, uh, the, the more thorough review. I also think it's important to note that, that Marchese uh, could have chosen to, um, uh, to deliver this under their pharmacy. In fact, the original Answer. contact was with the regulated pharmacy. They then chose to spin off a separate company that did fall Thank into you. this gray area, Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question today for the Minister of Research and Innovation. Our government really recognizes that bringing leaders together across sectors is one of the best ways we can drive innovation. Our province is home to world-class researchers, leading institutions, and we have very strong private sector partners that have helped make this province number six in the world for the quality and the impact of its research. This research creates jobs, it generates economic growth, and it makes Ontario, I think, one of the best places to live and work in. But, Speaker, through you to the Minister of Research and Innovation, what is our government doing specifically to ensure that leaders across all sectors, including government, are collaborating to produce the best outcomes for Ontario when it comes to research? Very Minister of Innovation and Research. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister of Research and Innovation, I am proud to be a part of the government that is forward-thinking and innovative. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, 
great advances can be made by sharing best practices, ideas, and resources. Our government recognizes the importance of collaboration. Collaboration will translate into job creation, better health care, cleaner environment, and a stronger economy. Mr. Speaker, recently our government invested $100 million in the Ontario Brain Institute. This investment will support a network of data on brain diseases across disciplines. Researchers will be able to turn information into clinical applications and commercialization opportunities. Answer. Mr. Speaker, data is the integral part of our knowledge-based economy. Thank, thank you. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. I'm glad to hear we're investing in an institution that's doing important work, as in the area of brain disease. I know that uh, the minister was traveling in the Thunder Bay area recently to the Regional Research Center. And we all know in this House, I think, that collaborating and sharing information is critical. We can find solutions to our shared challenges if we do that. Big data is a major trend in the technology and research communities and appears that's going to drive a lot of innovation. Some say that data is the currency of the new economy. Our ability to access, to understand, to search, organize information is important. So the work of the Ontario Brain Institute is a great example, I think, of the important work that can be done through sharing data. So, Speaker, through you again to the Minister, what other government First investments time. are being made to ensure the sharing of data? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member again for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the importance of data sharing. With our contribution of $7 million, IBM Canada was able to partner with the leading universities across the province to create the IBM Canada Research and Development Centre. Using state-of-the-art computing facilities of this centre is focusing on solutions on climate changes, gridlock, and also on the human brain mapping. Mr. Speaker, I recently attended a think conference organized by Orion, which is the Ontario Research and Innovation Optical Network, which is focused on big data. Orion members, Mr. Speaker, can access a global grid of research and innovation and educational networks. Students, educators, researchers, and the businesses, Mr. Speaker, across the province Answer. can access ex and explore data and share information. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to be a part of government whose investments in innovation, collaboration, Thank and you. also forward thinking projects is very much appreciated. Thank you. A member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, the government has, quote, known from the outset that the true cost of cancelling the Oakville plant are exponentially higher than $40 million. The Premier knew. The Minister knew. The Cabinet knew. The Liberal Caucus knew. And the Liberal Party knew. This government is rotten to its core. It's morally bankrupt. Premier, the time has come. Will you call the confidence motion so we can put your government out of its misery? Will you write Mr. your own Speaker, questions? This is a Premier who, when she took office, immediately offered a select committee to the opposition. They refused, Mr. Speaker, because they wanted to undertake a witch hunt against a former member of this legislature. This is a Premier, Mr. Speaker, who asked the Auditor General to look into the Oakville situation. And as has been pointed out, the OPA brought a number of figures, a number of estimates before the committee this morning and spoke about the complexity. Let's allow the Auditor General to do its work. This is a Premier who asked government members of the committee to come forward with a motion with the broadest search possible of government uh, ministries and agencies to produce documents and gas plants, and they voted against it, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, we have a Premier who will appear in front of the committee this Thank afternoon you. as invited, who is showing Thank you. transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Seated, please. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again to the Premier. The NDP may be willing to excuse your failures and nine years of scandal, but the PC caucus will not. The Liberal government has lost the moral authority to govern. It's over, Premier. Call the PC want of confidence motion today.
Mr. Speaker, who writes these questions? We have media interviews talking about the commitment the of the Progressive no Conservative Party to cancel those plants. We have statements in the legislature. Mr. Speaker, we have press releases. We have the Twitterverse. Mr. Speaker, we have the leader of the opposition appearing, starring in a YouTube video. All we have asked, Mr. Speaker, is that PC candidates, the leader of the opposition, come before the committee to explain their side of the story, the costing and analysis that they undertook. And so far, Mr. Speaker, we We've been stonewalled at every turn. We asked the Leader of the Opposition to be there today, and he played calendar, Mr. Speaker. We asked progressive Conservative candidates to come forward, Answer. and, Mr. Speaker, they cancelled at the last minute or refused to come forward. When will the progressive Conservative Thank Party you. show the level of transparency that the previous— Thank you. Uh, Thank you. New question? A member from Timmins, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, you will know because you were Minister of Education at the time that you, your government has followed a RFP process that has essentially put out of business small bus companies that have been operating for years in this province. Just last week, we had the Minister of Education say it was the perception of her ministry that, in fact, there are more small businesses that are in the, in the bus business today than there was before. Wow. How does that square up with the reality of all those small businesses that closed down across Ontario, from central Ontario to northern Ontario and across this province? Yes, and I, I'm uh, pleased to respond. As as uh, as the member knows, the we've, uh, we, as the member knows, we've asked our uh, school boards to move to consortiums so that they can consolidate the busing between the uh, public and the Catholic boards, and uh, that and provide a more efficient management of the service. Those uh, those consortiums then, in terms, have been asked by the Auditor General who looked at this and, and the Ministry, I agree. But the Auditor General, when he uh, did the first audit of school boards when we expanded his mandate, actually uh, looked at school board procurement of transportation services and uh, suggested Answer. that just having a contract that went endlessly on with no competitive procurement process was not an acceptable Thank you. process. Thank you. Supplementary. Tell you what's not acceptable is when the government decides they're going to put out of business. People have been operating buses in this province from 50 to 100 years. That's not what is acceptable. There are bus companies in Barrie, there are bus companies in Cornwall and in Timmins, Elgin and across this province who have been shut down as a result of this policy. And why? Because this government decides only the big, only the big, big international bus companies should be in the business of providing services to those school boards and to our children. I say again. Will you for once get the real perception and understand what you're doing is killing small businesses in this province, something that should not be done? Minister? Yes, thank you. And I think, I think it's important to uh, keep this in perspective that since 2003, our government has increased the funding for transportation services by 34%. In fact, if you look at, because you mentioned uh, small rural boards, we're actually provided the, in this school year that we're currently in, we've provided $217 million in funding specifically to rural boards for transportation. But you asked about what has happened with the procurement in those boards where they are doing a competitive procurement. And in fact, where the consortium is doing a competitive Answer. procurement, we've seen the number of local operators increase their market share from 39 percent to 49 percent. Your question, a member from Scarborough Southwest. Stand up and apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. A 
It's uh, never too late to be warned, and it's never too late to have someone named. Never. Thank you. Member, Asher. Get a two in here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Our government was the first in nearly a century to strengthen the Ontario Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act in 2009. This is something I'm very proud of. In Scar Scarborough Southwest, we have many animal rescue groups, and they are concer concerned about the well-being of all animals. There was discussion last fall about how Ontario can ensure that we continue to have the strongest animal welfare system in the country. Speaker, can the minister tell us what is our province doing to further strengthen right the protection of animals in Ontario? Strongest legislation. Minister, Minister, and security. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and I want to uh, thank the member from Scarborough Southwest uh, for his question. I know that he's. Uh, an animal lover, and uh, after I uh, announced a three-point plan, we consulted with many of our partners, including the OSPCA, the Canadian Council on Animal Care, the Ontario Veterinary College, the Canadian Federation of Human Society, various animal protection and advocacy groups like the Zuche, inter-ministerial partner, the, the AMO, the City of Toronto, and former employee from Marine Land and other uh, animal organizations. We have completed the consultation now, and we are reviewing the feedback. And our goal is the same. We wanted to start any uh, changes this spring, any required changes this spring, including possible legislative amendment to better protect animals in Ontario. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. The uh, member for Renfrew Nipissing Pengru on a point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Um, earlier today, in a uh, response to a question to the uh, member from Halton Hills, and I would like to cite. Order. Order. That might be funny, but. You still have to have decorum. The member on your point. I, I would like to draw your attention, uh, Speaker, to uh, Standing Order 23H. You don't even know what it is yet. Makes allegations against another member. The, the House Leader of the Government made allegations that the Leader of the Opposition refused to come before the committee, uh, the Justice Committee, looking into the gas plant Table those scandals. Papers. Uh, that the Liberals have perpetrated. I have in my hand, Speaker, which I will uh, present to you as well, a letter from the Leader of the Opposition indicating to the committee his... Okay. That's enough. Thank you. I, uh, I, will, uh, I will allow the member and any member at any time can correct the record if uh, they've made a, a statement that needs to be corrected. That is not my preview. It's the member's preview if they've made a statement that is not correct. I... Um, I, uh, I would like to uh, introduce in the speaker's gallery today a guest of mine, the mayor of Brantford, Chris Friel. Glad you're here with us, Chris. Thank you. The member from Nipissing, uh, point of order. To correct my record, I stated earlier that the uh, Oakville uh, cancellation costs from the uh, OPA were $1.1 billion. I've just redone the math, Speaker. I apologize. It's $1,094,000,000. Thank you. That is a point of order. Pursuant to. Uh, my goodness. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Timmins, James Bay. Thank you. Has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Education concerning bus contract RFPs. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. There are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. this afternoon.